Welcome to the Business of Story podcast, where the world's best storytellers from business, Hollywood, and beyond teach you how to use stories to communicate and connect with your customers. The Business of Story is sponsored by ACT, the best-selling customer management software for small business, and by Zignal Labs, the real-time cross-media story tracking platform. Here's your host, Park Howell from Park & Co., and today's special Business of Story guest. I think the measure of a great story is that it provokes you, pushes you into uncomfortable areas, makes you think, pisses you off, makes you happy, sad, laugh. Great stories are all about conflict. Welcome to the Business of Story, where we'll give you tips and tricks on how to use storytelling to advance your personal and professional quests further faster. Today, we have the Chief Storytelling Officer, my title for him, of a brand that is truly a provocateur in its industry, Patagonia. What makes them so provocative, at least to me, is that they go so far as to say, don't buy our clothes if you don't need to. You don't find any other American retailers talk, taking that stance with their sales. Now, the great thing, too, about Patagonia is they are remarkable publishers of content, not only around their product, but around the environment and the people and the worlds that they serve. In fact, over the weekend, I watched a relatively new documentary produced by Patagonia called Damn Nation. It's about the century of choking off our waterways by damming up rivers and streams in the name of progress. Now, I didn't realize that there are nearly 80,000 dams in the U.S., and there's a movement afoot that is beginning to tear down many of them to free our rivers. Now, I have to admit, I was pretty conflicted when I watched this film because I am the son of a dam builder. That's right. I grew up in Seattle. My dad and his company, Constructors Pamco, work on the Grand Coulee Dam on the Columbia River and even the Glen Canyon Dam on the Colorado, each of which were featured in Dam Nation. I and my brothers also put ourselves through college working as laborers for Constructors Pamco, and my last two summers were spent raising, as in building up, not tearing down, the Spotted Lake Reservoir Dam in the Cascades just northeast of Seattle. So I'm one of seven kids, and we were all raised in the outdoors, boating, camping, hunting, and fishing on and alongside these rivers and reservoirs. Of course, growing up, we always viewed these projects, projects as great feats of engineering, which brought life to the very arid eastern Washington area. And toward the end of my dad's career, his company spent a couple of years at Glen Canyon Dam working on the water tunnels. This provided us the opportunity for several boating explorations on Lake Powell. And if you've never been there, it is truly a wonder of the world, but at the expense of what? And that's what damnation really brought to my attention. So you can imagine the cognitive dissonance I was experiencing when I watched Patagonia's incredible documentary, Damnation, and I highly recommend you watching it. So with us today, the Director of Philosophy for Patagonia, who has been with them for 42 years since their inception, Vincent Stanley. And Vincent is going to share with us their approach, their unique approach to storytelling. Welcome, Vincent. Hi, Park. Um, thanks. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually uh, kind of, I'm moved by your story about uh, the cognitive dissonance between uh, your experience of of growing up and having uh, respect and admiration and awe for um, the work done to build these uh, immense dams, and then the feeling of conflict you have when you watch the film. I think one of the great things about the film is that they were able to, the filmmakers were really able to capture um, why free rivers are important. They really capture the feeling of it. And it may be that we're going through, we're all going through in our lifetime, a major shift in our attitude toward nature. And the, the attitude that uh, uh, was very common when you were growing up and when I was growing up mm -hmm. was to control the forces of nature that uh, interfered with human health and human advancement. And... I think what we're seeing now is uh, a moment of humility that all that work to control nature, we have actually um, uh, weakened its ability to sustain us uh, and to sustain our own industrial systems because we've 
impoverish nature through our efforts to control it. And mm-hmm. the, the shift that we have to have now is the sense of how are we going to how are we going to work more as a part of nature? How are we going to uh, use the forces of, of nature less um, aggressively and with less and with less uh, control, so that it inhibits the actual health of nature? Um, and that is behind a lot of the that. I, I think that shift in attitude is behind a lot of the work that we do at Patagonia. And, and cognitive dissonance, I think, was a great expression for you to use because we're still living with the old story. We still have um, our, our whole economy is based around um, the idea of, of uh, gross national product, um, the idea that anything we generate, any econ- economic activity we generate is going to be good in itself. Um, rather than some economic activities are actually uh, possibly going to hurt us. Um, we are developing a new story, but we are still living with the old one. And I think all of us suffer from that cognitive dissonance. One of the things that, and again, one of the things we're trying to do with Patagonia is to try to tell the new story in compelling ways. And how does Patagonia own that? I mean, you have got all kinds of books, movies. Really, you started content marketing back in the 70s, I think, with your catalogs because Patagonia took a decidedly different approach to its catalogs without selling. It was more educating and bringing people along on stories. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit, since you've been there since the beginning, what are the elements of storytelling that Patagonia has held dear that is in its DNA even to this day? Um, I think that one of the one of the things that we did is we ha- we had a good story to tell from the start. I mean, we before we were a clothing company, we were a mountain climbing equipment company that um, sold really wonderful climbing equipment. And then we went through this major shift in 1972 when we realized that the equipment we were making, these hard steel pitons, were actually damaging the rock. So we recommended to our customers that they shift to an entirely different kind of climbing gear, which we also made, but it was a huge risk for us to invest uh, in the tools and dies at that time. Um, And we told the story in a catalog. We said, listen, you're, you you know, we created this uh, revolution in climbing 15 years ago with hard steel pitons, but you really need to switch uh, to less damaging uh, equipment, and here's how you use this equipment. That change, that catalog that went out in 1972 changed the business overnight from 70% steel pitons to 70% aluminum chocks that created less damage when they were used. And I think that gave us the confidence that we could um, we could make a change if we treated our customers as friends, if we talked to them as friends and said, listen, this is this is the problem and this this is the way to solve it, that we could um, we had the confidence that we could do that. So we had a good story to tell from the beginning. We had some confidence on, on how to tell it. We had far more confidence and that than we had in our, any kind of conventional marketing abilities because uh, none of us came from a strong business background. So we really started out with that. Um, and I, I think that things have come full circle that now um, people are so good at marketing um, and uh, the, everything has gotten uh, so sophisticated that in some sense, you know, when I advise young business people uh, who are starting out a new company, I tell them, don't be afraid of your own story. I mean, I really have a strong sense that every business has its own DNA, just like every person has uh, uh, their own DNA and their own story. And I think people are often afraid to tell their story because they want to sound, uh, you know, they want to sound like the hip guys or the, or the, or the cool people in town. And, and that their story doesn't measure up. And then that, but I think that that's precisely where you go off because the more you tell, the more you discover your own story, 
the more you uncover what's different about your business's story than any, but any other businesses, you do a couple of things. You create a, a discipline for your business. You also create uh, marketing differentiation, which is one of the big business problems that people have right now. Um, so uh, mm-hmm. when I'm talking with young entrepreneurs, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make that point. Just figure out what your story is and, and don't be afraid of it and tell it strongly. You know, Vincent, um, conflict plays a lot in that. And in our last session of the Business of Story, we talked quite a bit about the importance of conflict and tension to make a good story. And I don't know if it's been your experience, but I've seen this with a lot of companies and in in the business world, is people are afraid to talk about conflict within their own organizations and in their own markets. And yet when they do, It's freeing, not only for the individual, but there seems to be more buy-in from the audiences because the audience appreciates your vulnerability and your transparency and ultimately your authenticity. Can you talk a little bit about Patagonia and how you have been able to hold on to this very authentic story of Patagonia, even in the face of falling down in a number of operational areas that you all willingly admitted to, but then you went to correct and moved your story forward? Yeah, um, I think conflict is is critical. It's also critical in a time where the where this you know the big story is changing. The one that we discussed at, at the opening of the of the podcast of of our whole relationship to uh, nature um, and everything that everybody is doing now involves an enormous amount of anxiety and conflict, um, both environmentally and in terms of social systems. One of the things that, one of the things that, cre- that helped us create the Footprint Chronicles is we were actually worried about um, people simplifying the story about Patagonia, about us becoming kind of a hero that people would put up on a pedestal when we knew, in fact, that we're just, you know, we're ordinary working folks we are trying to make big changes, but we're part of, of a larger industrial system. And um, some changes can be made quicker than others. Um, and some things are important to be called out to say, listen, this is a problem here. We don't know what to do about it yet, but uh, this, this is what we think right now. Mm-hmm. We did all that with Footprint Chronicles, partly to get our customers in on the complexity of making things. I think there's one of the, one of the problems with storytelling um, is that people often want a simple story. And, um, you know, a story with a, good, with a, with a hero and with a, uh, with a villain. And um, in our experience, yeah, there are heroes and villains, but Far more often, there are. Um, uh, it's not that cut and dry, and that if customers expect you to either be a hero or a villain, it um, takes away from the capacity to actually uh, make change, and to it takes away from that kind of richer reality you need to share with your customer in order to have an ongoing relationship with the customer, if that makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And for our listeners, can you explain a little bit about what Footprint Chronicles is and where they can go and uh, experience it? Yeah. It, uh, they could go on our website. Um, I've forgotten whether we still you can still go in through footprintchronicles.com, but you can go to patagonia.com and, and uh and use Footprint Chronicles is in the in the search field. It is um, how what we've done is to take several products and to uh, uh, trace those products back to the suppliers. In some cases, back to the mills or back to the farm uh, or back to uh, the uh, a sewing factory, um, and then all the way to our, our warehouse in Reno. And uh, we began with five products in uh, 2007, just sort of telling their story, and then we expanded it. 
Well, that's great. And speaking of products and stories, I think this is a good time right now to take a quick break and let us introduce you to one of our wonderful sponsors of the Business of Story podcast. And we'll be right back with Vincent Stanley of Patagonia. Your customers, employees, marketing campaigns, partners, and yes, your detractors, they're each telling a story right now about you. Where? On social media, in traditional print publications, in blog posts, on television, basically everywhere. And it's happening 24-7, in real time. Your mission? Track these stories and the sources that share them. Smartly manage them. Analyze them rapidly and discern what you should do next, what you should do now. No wonder you're tired. Well, Zigna Labs is a real-time cross-media story tracking platform that makes your life easier. Their solution enables customers to quickly spot trends, see relevant stories unfold, and take action. So stay ahead of what the world thinks with Zigna Labs. Learn more and sign up for a free demo at zignalabs.com forward slash story. Well, welcome back to the Business of Story and Vincent Stanley of Patagonia. Now, Vincent, I read in Fast Company magazine a few months ago, there's a terrific article in there called The Purpose-Driven Marketer, How Patagonia Uses Storytelling to Turn Consumers into Activists. Can you tell us a little bit about the philosophy behind that and how do you actually go about storytelling to turn consumers into activists? Um, I think the damnation is a good example of uh, where we are really uh, working with our customer base or with our community base uh, to, to raise an issue um, and to uh, get some action on it. We started doing this, as, as you mentioned, back in uh, 25 years ago with, in our catalogs, where we would talk a, about a particular issue environmental issue that we didn't think had uh, a lot of exposure and we would uh, try and educate customers over time and then usually conclude the campaign with some kind of uh, effort to get something done. Um, in the case of damnation, we're, we're working to uh, take down a series of dams on the Snake River. We submitted a, a petition to uh, uh, President Obama um, and it's, it's, this has been a tradition with us for, for about 25 years. We're now working more with film than we are with catalog. Mm-hmm. And do you find your different storytelling techniques, one works better than the other? And, I mean, if we review them real quick. So you started in the catalog business. And I know Red Bull, for instance, gets rave reviews as a content marketer. But you all were doing this way before them. So I'm wondering if they're taking leads from you. But your catalog, your website, the work uh, that you've done with the Footprint Chronicles, how you were chronicling your supply chain and you know being very transparent – the books you've written, uh, you've got a couple of them out. And by the way, the responsible company that you um, wrote with your founder is really a terrific read. Um, the new localism. I mean, I go d- uh, down the list. What story el- uh, story tactics do you find seem to work the best with your audiences these days? Um, I don't know that there's a particular there's there's one particular tactic. I, th- I think one of the things that we grapple with internally is that we have a, at this point we have a lot of stories to tell, um, both about product in terms of what we're in terms of innovation and also what we're trying to do environmentally. So with uh, um, uh, traceable down, um, with uh, merino wool. Uh, uh, being raised by farmers who are trying to uh, regenerate the grasslands in Patagonia. So we have a lot of product-related stories, and then we have some environmental issues that we're particularly passionate about, and water is water is one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that it's a good question, and I'm not sure I know, I know the answer. We mm-hmm. got kind of a full... Um, uh, we, we we try everything. Film is certain. If you can make a powerful film, that's certainly uh, uh, a great uh, a great way to get things across. Um, 
and they don't even need to be as long as Damnation. I mean, that's a full-featured documentary, and it's brilliantly right. produced, beautifully shot, by the way. Um, but you had mentioned earlier your traceable down little animated short. That's about right. two minutes long. And for the listeners out there, if you want to just see a really very inventive way to talk about something as down – Um, and have fun doing it, watch it, because they animated it to Blue Oyster Colts, Don't Fear the Reaper, and it's just brilliantly done. Um, But you also, in um, your, what's the local program that you're doing right now, The New Localism, you've got three short films there that range, I think, from two minutes to 28 minutes, and they tell remarkable stories in a very short amount of time. Do you, what, what are you finding with the attention span of your viewers and listeners these days? Um, I think attention spans are underrated. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, I think if you make a good film that you can uh, uh, do a longer film and you can write a longer article and people will will pay attention. Um, Mm -hmm. Bears Ears, I think, has gotten quite quite a strong response Mm -hmm. and a a couple of the other videos. The new uh, Ramon Navarro film, is getting an amazing response. That's the 28-minute film. Is that the uh, fisherman son, down yes. off of Chile? Yeah, son of a fisherman. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one of the things that we're able to do now, because we, we have, we're not a, a major retailer, but we do have about 30 stores across the U.S., and we have another 30 stores internationally, is to tie some of these campaigns in with uh, our, our local stores so we can actually connect with our customers both through the catalog through the uh, or and, and, and the uh, the econ business and through the and through the stores mm-hmm and what advice over all the years that you've done this and like you said I think it's very interesting that you came into this not from a, a very trained business perspective, but really just from an outdoors perspective. In fact, Yvonne Chouinard, the founder's first book, I think, was Let My People Go Surfing, The Education of a Reluctant Businessman. Right. So I, that sounds like that kind of speaks to Patagonia. For our listeners, um, small businesses to large businesses to content marketers, what are the two or three tips that you might share with them to help them make their stories resonate more with their audiences? I think uh, first make it specific. Um, don't don't uh, talk to customers in terms of generalities. Um, tell your story. Figure out what your story is, and then tell it. And it's not your competitor's story, and it's not the the company you admire the most. It's not uh, it's not that story. It's the story of your particular enterprise. Um, those are the two uh, two major things I would advise. And then the third thing, and this sounds a little ab- abstract, but to really treat um, customers as friends. Um, if you if you figure that uh, the six degrees of, of separation story is true, which it is, um, your best bet and having a relationship with the customer is to assume that you're going to meet them on the street someday and, um, or uh, have a coffee or a drink with them. And that the way you talk to that customer should be the way you would talk to anybody else, any, a friend that you were trying to persuade of a particular point of view or, or uh, uh, to sell a particular product. And the only other thing is that, um, I think that all of this advice works if you're making very if you're making quality stuff and you're or or uh, selling a quality service and if you're not then it doesn't work so well um, and then I would look at kind of the basis of the business that you have and uh, I I do think the future for the the long range future for businesses is going to be higher quality goods and, and, and services. And certainly businesses that are supported by the stories they tell, the story has to be true. Hmm. Great, great point. So tell your story, know it, own it, tell your story, treat your customers 
like your friends, the six degrees of separation because you're going to run into them on the sidewalk, yeah. whether you like it or not. And you or in social media. They're going to run into you in social media. <laughs> exactly, exactly, or that virtual sidewalk, and then produce the goods, back up the stories that you tell. Yeah. Let's take one last break here before our close, and um, let's thank, again, another one of our terrific sponsors, and uh, we'll be right back with Vincent Stanley of Patagonia. Are you keeping track of sales leads in a spreadsheet or worse, post-it notes all over your desk? Well, there's a better way, and it doesn't involve spending a fortune on complex CRM software. For over 25 years, ACT has been the number one best-selling contact and customer management software. It's super affordable and easy to use. ACT helps individuals, small businesses, and sales teams organize prospect and customer details in just one place. It also helps you market products and services more effectively, and most importantly, it drives sales. Try ACT for 30 days by visiting actstory.com and sign up for a chance to win a pair of Bose QuietComfort 20i acoustic noise-canceling headphones, a $299 value. Again, that's actstory.com. Welcome back to the Business of Story and my special guest today, Vincent Stanley, the Director of Philosophy at Patagonia. It's great having you here, Vincent. Um, you've been with Patagonia since the beginning, and there's no better storyteller around really making consumers into activists, in my humble opinion anyways, than Patagonia. Um, Vincent, you've also been very kind um, in, in, in giving us, sharing your thoughts and insights with our class at Arizona State University. I teach a storytelling course in the Executive Masters for Sustainability Leadership there, and you've done two terrific webinars with our students, and our students are executives from around the world, and a lot of them are coming in through finance, through operations, through the C-suite, and they are changing, pivoting their course to do something more meaningful in their terms, and that is to follow a path of sustainability. My job in doing that is to introduce them to great storytellers like you and Patagonia and help them learn, much like our listeners, what you have experienced over the years, what worked and what doesn't work. One of the things that I hear time and time again from our clients at Park and Company, our agency, and our students is, I don't really have a very interesting story to tell. And I think you touched on this a little bit earlier. And what one pe- some people will say to me, well, sure, that's Vincent Stanley, that's Patagonia. They have an amazing story to tell. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't that way in the beginning. So what, how can you coach our listeners into, say, you know, into finding that really unique, amazing story and sharing it? Well, I think that that, that involves uh, a process of self-discovery on the part of the people who are in business. I've never met an entrepreneur who didn't have an amazing story. It's a matter of uh, uncovering it and having confidence in it. I, um, I, I, you know, it's hard to talk without specifics, and I don't actually want to uh, – I, I, I actually will tell a story. I've got two Yale students who are – they're Yale Business School. They're a couple – and they decided to create an organic cotton dress shirt business. And um, first of all, that's a story of how they came to be in the business. And he used to be a dean at Harvard Divinity School. Almost everybody who is an entrepreneur and has gotten into a business has gone through some kind of interesting change. Um, they are, you know, making these shirts of Egyptian cotton from a, Italian uh, specialty mill and then having them sewn in a, uh, a factory in Fall River, Mass. that was uh, basically saved by the employees. I mean, all of that has it's an it, it, it's simple stuff, and they might they might they're they're going to tell all that, but they might not have been they they might have had resistance to telling that because I, I have another couple of friends. Who have never told, they've been in business 20 years, they've never told their story. She's from uh, a designer who grew up on a farm in Iowa. He was a machinist who grew up in um, Salta, Argentina. Um, they have this amazing uh, little company that the outdoor industry has kept going for uh, uh, 20 or 30 years. And they don't, they don't really, they, they think it's too, it feels too personal to them to reveal that. And, and my, my sense is that's, um, you know, precisely 
the kind of thing that uh, makes people want to deal do business with you is to understand something about why you're in business and if you're in business for for good reasons or interesting reasons if you really have a, a passion for the product you're making or the service uh, the the service you're offering people connect to that mm -hmm. um, so I would figure out what it is um, and um, I I would challenge I would I think I could spend 10 minutes with anybody who said they had a boring story and tell them, no, it's not. There's no human being on the planet with a boring story. Exactly. One thing we find, Vincent, too, when we're digging down to find that story is we ask the person about that moment. And then they always look at me like, what do you mean that moment? And there's always a moment in each of our lives that we finally have decided to take a stand on something that has been bothering us. Uh -huh. Typically conflict, again, tension. Yeah. Yeah. And it may be leaving a job, it may be starting a new business, it may be accepting a new job, um, but we're doing it because there was a moment in our life where we finally were sort of fed up with the status quo and we wanted to go on our journey. And, and do you have that moment in your life? I mean, when you think back, you've been with Patagonia a long time. When you started that company, is there a moment that you can reflect upon that has led you all these years with the terrific brand of Patagonia? I think it's been ongoing. I, I came to the company intending to work for six months. Uh, <laughs> so, and uh, um, uh, I ended up staying uh, for several different reasons. And I, I, I think, first of all, it was, a, it was an interesting challenge. It was a fun company just as a, as a, as a business to try and build in the early years. Um, and then increasingly it's become interesting to to me because of the environmental work and the development of that. And then I became kind of interested, as you mentioned, in the responsible company. One of the reasons I had for working on that with you all is I was wondering how our culture had survived in, um, in some powerful way from when it was very small and 10 people and $400,000 a year to, to what it is today. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been a series. There hasn't been a, um, in my life, I, when I deal with a lot of my students, um, there's been a, a particular shift. They've gone through a certain career uh, uh, and, they, and they've taken a turn. They've decided to do something else. And with me, it's been more sort of uh, threads. I've been on the business side. I've been a writer. Um, and more and more, I've been putting those two uh, strains of my life together. But I, I haven't had a kind of um, turning point where I've gone to the left or the right or turned around. It's more uh, um, that staying with the same company, it's been an experience that's deepened with time and has presented a, enough new challenges that it doesn't feel, uh, I don't, I'm not waiting for my, uh, my gold watch. <laughs> Maybe titanium anyway. It? And their two gold watches are too heavy anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, Vincent, with that, I know you're very busy. Um, you, uh, by the way, when we first started this recording, he had a whole wall of birds outside his his New York uh, hotel room, I guess, and they, they were tweeting away, and we had to close that window because it was too loud. But I thought, what an appropriate soundtrack, backdrop, sound effect for uh, our interview today. But I want to thank you so much for your time. I know you're very, very busy. And uh, just do you have any parting thought for us? No, thanks for um, having me on. And um, I think it's uh, great that you're doing this. Um, uh, and in terms of, as a parting thought, kind of putting together your insight of conflict with um, what I've been talking about and kind of identifying the story. Is there a tension in your particular work and your particular approach to what you're making or the service you're offering that really illustrates to uh, your customer, a potential customer, um, what the benefit of your product or service is? Is there some kind of uh, conflict there that can be illuminating and don't be afraid of it? Yeah, that's a great point. And, in fact, that was a point that kind of resonated through our last show on the business of stories. So I appreciate that. 
at the end of these, I always kind of like to wrap it up with a moral. And I was going to start with the moral based off of the damnation video that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. <laughs> You know, that that those folks didn't really mean to be doing the environmental damage they were doing. It was really meant to help humanity as best they can, but times have changed. But I thought since talking with you that that was kind of a downer. So instead, I would like to think about Joseph Campbell, you know, America's foremost mythologist, in a line that I often quote from him when he says, we're not on our journeys to save the world, but to save ourselves. And in that process, you save the world. And I think that's what you've kind of talked about today when you've encouraged our listeners to really understand their own unique personal story, the universal truths within those, and then be led by that into the world and go and make real change. All right. Nicely said. Thank you. Well, thank you, Vincent, and uh, thank you all for listening this edition of The Business of Story. Please go to thebusinessofstory.com to download all kinds of different storytelling tools that you can use immediately to make you your stories more engaging, more entertaining, and more moving and help you move your quest further faster. Also, if you like what you're hearing, please go to iTunes and leave a review for us. We would appreciate that. And, of course, share this knowledge because I have found over the past 10 years when I've been out teaching story that it first does start with your own internal story. Provides Story provides a north star for us all to follow to go out and do meaningful work that impacts the world in great, great ways. Again, thank you and uh, look forward to having you back on our next edition of The Business of Story. Thanks for tuning in to The Business of Story. Don't forget there are terrific free storytelling resources for you at thebusinessofstory.com, where you'll also find the complete show archive. The Business of Story is sponsored by Park & Co., Zignal Labs, and ACT, and is produced by Convince & Convert Media. Find more great shows like The Business of Story at marketingpodcasts.com, the first search engine for marketing podcasts.